So I would imagine that for you or somebody in your shoes that you have this moment when you realize your mom has a name and she's a person. And then you probably had another moment when you realized that she was Donna Summer, that everybody in the world knew who she was, not just your friends and family and people in your life. What is that first like awakening? Like, oh, wait a second. She's, you know. You know, it's funny. I, I've been actually really trying to pinpoint a specific moment and it's really cloudy for me. My, my younger sister, Amanda, has a very direct memory. But for me, I think it was just the understanding. There was always people around us in our family and or coming up to us. And I just remember that from a very young age that people we didn't know would come up and and love on us and share share their stories and and know who my mother was and so it's for me i don't know a time when that didn't exist did you just think oh like she's really popular she has so many friends like <laughs> yeah i guess so i don't i don't know when i i think to be honest with you maybe it was this moment when i was about 7 or 8 years old i can't remember exactly the year we went to go see michael jackson at wembley stadium and it was that moment she got to take us backstage and meet. And at that time, he was at the pinnacle of his career and all of these things. And it was like understanding, like, oh, my mom can do this. <laughs> you know? like right. What was your intention in creating this documentary about your mom? You know, I think in really reviewing I've been getting this question a lot. And I think really at the crux of the matter, it really is I became a mom okay. and I didn't have my mom. And so it really brought up a lot of feelings and a lot of questions. And, mm -hmm. you know, I was a working mother. And so it was really, I was kind of like, oh, I wonder what she would have done in this situation or what did she do? And I couldn't ask her. So there was that element. And then because I was working and kind of out there, people would come up to me, fans would come up to me and they would share their personal stories, their own memories with my mother or with a particular song or album. And I just really felt like there was so much that people didn't really know about her or really fully understand. And that even for the fans who loved her so deeply, they also maybe needed their own sense of closure to her life and her story. And so really that's kind of what, what set me off. Okay. And the title of the film, Love to Love You, Donna Summer, is based on her breakout song, Love to Love You Baby, mm -hmm. uh, which really is what put her into the limelight. And I never heard the original cut of the song. I've heard wow. the radio edit of the song. And yeah. then, I, you know, when I watched the documentary, I was like, oh, OK. So it's very sexual, right? Mm -hmm. Almost. I'll say it's provocative. <laughs> very provocative, but simulating provocativeness. Yes. <laughs> so, yes. like, as her daughter, how, did, how does that hit? You know, I think it depends on what age you asked me that question. You know, yeah. I think as when I first discovered that song, like in the film, that moment of me going to my younger sister, Amanda, and going like, oh my gosh, do I have a crazy song for you? And that was a real interaction because we would go to my mom's shows, but when we were younger, she didn't perform that song on stage anymore. She And so it was really like a whole revolution in terms of like, who she was to us in our own mind at that point. Right. And you know, I think as we've gotten older, I think we understand the door that it opened for her and that, you know, she understood that this was something that was going to kind of be her entree onto the world stage. And, and so she owned it. And I think it really, in so many ways, was very empowering for so many people to see and witness a woman particularly a black woman be on stage and just own her own power. And so, you know, it was, it was groundbreaking for the time, you know, and in terms of using that song as the title, you know, obviously there's the obvious love to love you connection, but we also wanted it to feel like a love letter in a sense, you know, that is love to love you like from Donna Summer. And so okay. we thought, we felt like that was a really kind of, meaningful touch in the way that the film was shot and that it was really trying to come as much from her perspective as possible.
And by the way, there, I think the clip is in the film, but I've watched it over and over again when she, a little bit later in her career, when she sings, if there is music there, mm -hmm. I, cr I cry like a baby. And I've watched that clip three times over the last week. And I cry like a baby every time oh. it's <laughs> something in my soul. And I'm sure I'm not the only one. And I'll say this about your mother. And whether you're talking about love to love you, baby, or if there is music there or hard for the money, she's one of the few singers who actually really embodies the character and the story of the song that she is singing. She doesn't just sing a song. Yeah. She becomes the song, right? And then that's a perfect way to put it. She became the songs. And I think that was really what set her apart. And I think why her music transcends, you know, decades and generations is because of that very fact. I think that was one of her real gifts was to really take each song individually and come from whatever that emotional place was to deliver it and to connect with her audiences. And so I, I think that's why her music transcends. And you mentioned earlier that you had, you have a daughter, right? I do. I do. I, and a son. I have two children now. Whoa. Okay. And your mom wasn't here in, in the physical. No. What did you learn from her mothering that you use as a mother? You know, I think one of the biggest things is to obviously just like warmth and love, but also to include my kids in our, in my, I, she very much included us in her creativity and in her art. And so I try to do that with my kids, you know, they're, they're their own little artists and actors and singers in their own right. And to just really encourage that and to make them a part of my process and to see for them to see me working and, and what that takes. My mom would take my sisters and I on the road with her and we would work backstage. And so we had a real understanding of behind the camera and, and in, in front of the camera or backstage or on stage. And so I try to, I try to include my kids in my journey. Okay. And you know how we all have that moment when you realize that your mom's name is not mommy, that she actually has a first name. Yes. Yes. But I kind of vaguely remember when I think I was maybe like seven or eight when that happened for me. Yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I would imagine that for you or somebody in your shoes that you have this moment when you realize your mom has a name and she's a person. And then you probably had another moment when you realized that she was Donna Summer, that everybody in the world knew who she was, not just your friends and family and people in your life. What is that first like awakening? Like, oh, wait a second, she's, you know. You know, it's funny. I, I've been actually really trying to pinpoint a specific moment and it's really cloudy for me. My, my younger sister, Amanda, has a very direct memory. But for me, I think it was just the understanding. There was always people around us in our family and or coming up to us. And I just remember that from a very young age that people we didn't know would come up and and love on us and share share their stories and, and know who my mother was. And so it's for me, I don't know a time when that didn't exist. Did you just think, oh, like she's really popular. She has so many friends. Like, <laughs> yeah, I guess so. I don't I don't know when it, I think to be honest with you, maybe it was this moment. When I was about seven or eight years old, I can't remember exactly the year, we went to go see Michael Jackson at Wembley Stadium. And it was that moment she got to take us backstage and meet. And at that time, he was at the pinnacle of his career and all of these things. And it was like understanding, like, oh, my mom can do this. <laughs> you know? like, I, she's so I think it, it might have been maybe that moment, like where it really hit home. Like, oh, wow, she has a lot of access. Like people like treat her maybe a little differently. Okay. That's, and that's pr a pretty cool, like pivotal memory, I would say. Well, I got to dance on stage with Michael Jackson in the pouring rain at Wembley stadium. It's one of the biggest Cheryl Crow was back up for him at the time. And it was one of the most like memorable, remarkable moments of my life of feeling all of that positive, joyful energy coming across, you know? Yeah, that's it was amazing. pretty cool. So tell me about your parents' love story. From your um, perspective. Yeah, from my perspective. So uh, as my dad says in the film, the from the moment they met, they basically were together. I think that, you know, both of my parents are artists by nature. 
and they saw in each other that need to create and connect it on that level, but also just had this a very deep bond. My parents were married for, I mean, 32 years when my mom passed away. So they really, you know, when they got together, nobody thought that they would last. <laughs> Everybody was like, why did, why did nobody think that they would last? Well, I think it was a few things. I think they both were really strong personalities. They both were extremely driven. They both came. I mean, it was also an interracial relationship. My dad was from a very- When they got together in the 70s. In the 70s, I think they really started dating maybe 77, 78. So at the time that was, you know- especially in a relationship that was had so much visibility was not, you know, so I think there was that dynamic where people were like, okay, maybe under the pressure, this is not going to last, you know? And so I just think that, you know, at first people were like, okay, we'll see. But I think really the things that bonded them together, which was they both had a very strong sense of, and faith in, in God and in family. Uh, they both loved to create and, and did that well with each other and really, were very symbolic in the way that they would write songs together. And, and so, you know, I think that they really just had very deep love and that translated through all of the trials and tribulations that they came across. Okay. And in the film, it seems like your mom, when she was diagnosed with lung cancer, the way it was portrayed in the documentary is that she wasn't a complainer. She didn't want her illness to take center stage. And she didn't even really want it to be a thing. Like she really didn't want to address the elephant in the room. That's kind of like how it was portrayed. But in the, on the day to day, behind the scenes, at home, just with you guys, like, go, what was the process that she went through in dealing with that diagnosis? You know, my my mother was extremely strong as a person, and I think her you know, I think her decision not to share it with the world was that, you know, she was extremely faithful and she really believed that God was going to heal her and wanted to put all the positive energy out there for that and only wanted people that would give her that energy. And, you know, for so many things, when you're a person in the public eye, you end up carrying a lot of people's emotions for them. And I think she at that time didn't think she could also carry other people's fear about her, her illness or their expectations about what it would look like. And she just really wanted the time to be able to focus on herself and family. And I think she just tried to walk that out. You know, I, I was kind of right in the middle of it with her and my father and my aunt and just really trying to be there day to day and, and have her eat healthy and do all the things to for her to have those moments where she could feel as best as she could under the circumstances. And so, you know, she was a trooper. She was just one of the strongest people that I've ever known. I mean, even the doctor was like, any other person would be in the hospital now. And my mom never ended up in the hospital. And wow. so she just had a strength and a will that was beyond anybody that I've ever experienced before. Did she pass at home? She did. Yeah, she did. Okay. Yeah, in Florida, actually, in Naples, Florida. Yeah. Oh, okay. That's right. She had a home in Naples. Mm -hmm. Okay. Was there a moment where she thought, yeah, this is it. Um, you know, um, this is my time. This is going to happen. She never verbalized that. Okay. I think there was a moment probably where, you know, I could see her wrestling with it just internally. We didn't talk about it. She was going to fight. She fought until the end. Okay. And she also, she had a precedent setting lawsuit during her career. Mm -hmm. Well, before she went to Geffen Records, she was with, was it Casablanca Records? Casablanca Records, yes. Okay. And she sued Casablanca Records for her publishing rights. Well, it wasn't, I, I actually don't think it was about the publishing specifically. I think it was more a contractual obligation than the, the publishing. I think there, you know, it's funny, we were thought about unpacking that whole thing within the film and it was just very weedy in terms of all the legal leads of it all. Right. But he just wanted to be out of her contract. And I think, you know, there was some things changing in terms of who was going to be in charge. And she she sued to get out of it and to 
to be able to move forward in the way that she thought she wanted her career to move forward. And to be honest, it was at the peak of her career, you know, and so it was a really big risk for her to take, not only on the business side of it, but Neil Bogart and the whole team at Casablanca at that point were really like family to her. And so it was a really, really difficult time for her because she was so close to them. And, you know, thankfully we've all mended bridges and she was able to mend bridges after and before he passed, you know, and so thankfully we are on, on great terms with them at this point in life. I, I, I will say that my mom had a lot of forgiveness and a lot of love for the people in, in, involved in her life. Why do you think she described, and I'm obviously I'm sure this happened during a dark time, but why do you think she described the music business as being raped over and over again? You know, I think when you're an artist, you're naturally sensitive because mm -hmm. you're in tune with the world in a way that maybe not everybody is. And I think that's what makes you aware and really able to articulate things in a way that maybe most people don't. Mm -hmm. And so I think, you know, the music business is a business. It can be cutthroat and it can be about money and, and power and all of the things that drive industry. And that a lot of times is at odds with the sensitivity of an artist and the need to, to grow. And I think that was one of the biggest things and challenges of even her time at Casablanca. It, it was that she wanted to, to be an artist maybe in a different way than they wanted her to be. And she wanted to grow and write more of her music, which she did, and kind of be a little bit more in control about her own destiny. And so I think that's what she was articulating. Okay. And there was another controversy that happened in her life. I think you, I'm sure you know what I'm going to say. When she, at one point, she was very passionate about giving her life over to Christ. And she, she was a born again Christian. And she made a comment. I don't know. I guess, I don't know if it was an offhand comment. It was the Adam and Steve versus Adam yes. and Steve. It was part of, you know, my mom did shtick on stage and it was part of an offhanded kind of thing that was intended to be funny. It was not received that way. I think after a period okay. of time, it was not like her going on stage and giving so like she, she kind of exactly, <laughs> it was like a bad attempt at a joke. It wasn't meant to be taken. No. And I think, you know, and I think part of the reason why, which we talk a little bit about in the film, my parents didn't address it is because the intent was not meant to be hurtful and, and but obviously it was it was received and many people were hurt by that so you know we wanted to acknowledge that but all of the the way that it snowballed and the things that people said about her and about how she felt about the, you know the lgbtq community was completely the antithesis of who she was and i think that was really where a lot of her internal conflict happened because you know, I always say my lived experience was not that controversy. We had so many people from that community as a part of our daily lives and a part of, was such a big part of her fan base. And so it's always been, I've always experienced as a complete love fest and joy. And right. so it was tricky going back to that. But I think as a family wanted to acknowledge that that hurt people, but that was not who she was. And so, yeah. you know, we hope like with the film as a whole, that it's about healing and it's about acknowledging and it's about healing. And I think that was one of the main themes of the film and this was one aspect of that. So we thought it was important to include it. Well, I think anytime you do a documentary, cause I've, I mean, I've watched so many documentaries and it typically it's the family behind the documentary. And they say, well, if we're gonna cover our mother, our son or you know, whoever's life, we have to show everything. We have to show that this was a complex human being. and I think that what's so hard about being in the public eye is that when I'm joking around with my friends or family members, I mean, God, the things that I've said, just because I, you know, when you're being unfiltered and you're just being silly and funny and crazy and weird, and sometimes you're just being, I guess I would say lazy with your words, right? I mean, all kinds of things, verbal diarrhea, right? And <laughs> but there's, no, there, there's no camera on you at the time. Yeah. Yes. And, yeah. and the media has a way of saying, well, she said this one thing, we can create a narrative out of this and keep pumping out stories. Well, and I think it was one of those things where she did come back to her faith. 
And I think the times were changing and, you know, a lot of it kind of got all lumped together and then people just started talking and then the rumor mill happens. But yeah. I think, you know, she was kind of caught in, in a changing time about what you could say and what you couldn't. And oh, she, oh think, she would love it today. She would go, she'd be like, whoa, what's going on now? Well, it was a little bit of that. It was a little bit of what we're experiencing in terms of, of cancel culture. And I think she was, she felt the brunt of, of that. And I think, you know, so people thought, oh, well, she's, she's a spiritual Christian. For, I mean, she was always spiritual, but she's now part of a religious situation. So she must mean this by when she said that. And I think it just, it got to be a whole mess and it was really unfortunate. And it was something that, you know, she really, um, it, it was hard because she, she was somebody who lived her life with love. Hands that down. Came through one hand, hands down. That is who she what was. That's what she wanted to project. That's mm -hmm. how any interaction. I it's it's interesting because every single person I talk to for this, and I talked to many people from all parts of her life, had nothing but love. Even if they had a complicated relationship, they loved my mother deeply and felt deeply loved by her. And that's just who she was. And I think that was really the heartache of that situation was that people would question her and inte her integrity exactly. in that way. Okay. And you co-directed this film with Roger Ross Williams, who yes. is an Academy Award winning director. Amazing, amazing director. Yes. I feel How so did that, like, was it you who approached him or him who he who approached you? Well, you know, it was something I had, you know, I had come to the conclusion after a period of time that I wanted to direct this film. Mm -hmm. And, you know, but I also hadn't done it before. You know, I'd been an actress for many years, but this was my first feature and my first doc. And so I had been a fan of Roger's work. Uh, his film Life Animated is phenomenal. And I, I when I watched that film particularly, I, I got a sense that he understood family and he understood emotion and how to tell that story with a lot of truthfulness and honesty. And so I was a fan of his and knew his work. And so I had met one of his longtime producers in the process. And so she came on board as our producer and then connected Roger and I. And okay. so when we sat down for lunch to discuss if this is something we could do together, his vision and my vision was like the same. And, you know, he was, I think, probably a little reluctant because he's like, okay, this is the daughter of, is she going to want to do some kind of like sanitized sugar coat version of her, her mother? And mm -hmm. I didn't. I really wanted to tell the truth. And it was a really important for that honesty to come through. And I knew that he could, he knew how to tell those kind of stories. And so our vision was the same. We had a fantastic uh, time doing the film. Like we make a joke, like we really didn't argue at all <laughs> because, and I think we were able to accomplish, you know, this is a different kind of music doc. And I think we were able to accomplish it and have the film that we were able to create because we both were in such alignment with our vision. And there was something else in the film. And I actually asked my mother because she's in your, your mom's age group. My mother is 73. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And when I was watching the documentary, I said, I was like, I was, she was at my house and I shouted, I was like, Hey mom, do you remember a time when it was in the news that Donna Summer had been a victim of domestic violence? And she was like, no, I never heard of anything like that. And I said, Oh, because it's, you know, it's talking about that. She had been before your father, she had been in a previous yeah. relationship and she had been physically assaulted and, you know, really badly treated. She's like, no, I never, I, it was, that was never in the news. No. Did she purposely, I guess, keep that part of her life under wraps? Because I don't know anyone who knew anything about that. No, I, I don't think anybody in the public would have known. My mother was a very private person. Mm -hmm. And I think she was very open in many ways and in sharing her gift and being very like grounded and down to earth with people and gracious in that way, but she was an extremely private person. And, you know, I think it was important for us to share that part of her story because I think it's what made her human. And I think that's, you know, those trials and tribulations that she had to overcome really just show you how amazing the fact that she was able to make this pinnacle of success and survive it and just what that journey was like. And just, you know, and I think it's hopefully a message to, 
many other women, particularly out there, women out there that, you know, you don't have to stay in that situation and that you can move on from it and really do have a successful life and marriage and relationship. So, you know, I, I, I think that was why it was important for us to include. Okay. And I don't know what your spiritual beliefs are, um, but I believe that when our loved ones, cro- they cross over into spirit and they're very much alive, just not in physical form. Um, so with that, I believe being- that too. <laughs> do. Okay. So we're on the same page. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so with that being said, well, first of all, what do you have any rituals that you do when you're having a moment where you really feel your mom's presence or you really miss her, like anything that you do that kind of makes you feel close to her with your sisters or anything? You know, it's not necessarily a a ritual. It's just the acknowledgement of like, hi, mom. You know, I, I really feel almost now more than ever that that mo that wherever she is or everybody, it's not far. She's just right here. She's, she's right here with me. And so I think I live my life and operate in a way where I acknowledge that she is that close. And there's been many times and many moments in this filmmaking process and over the years where something will happen and I'm like, okay, here she is. Roger and I would make a joke that she was the one actually directing this. (laughs) Um, Because there's been so many kind of divine little moments and things that would happen to just to just let us know that she was, she was, um, you know, a- acknowledging that she was happy with what was happening and we were headed in the right direction. What was a sign or what, what are signs that you, you believe that you get from her? Well, you know, I mean, obviously her music follows me everywhere. You know, mm-hmm. I think it's one of those things where I will show up and I'll be somewhere and there, there's a song playing. And so I'm like, okay, I know that I'm supposed to be here in this particular moment there's those kind of obvious things, but it's even like, for example, she passed away May 17th and, you know, we've been working on this film for so many years. And when HBO gave us our air date in our air week, it was the same week as her passing. And so it was just like, oh, okay, here we are. And just even like a little thing happens where, you know, I think if somebody doesn't believe in the things that we maybe believe in, in terms of the spiritual side of it, they'd be like, oh, that's just a coincidence. Right. But too many of these things happen to be just a coincidence. Exactly. But the hairstylist I was working with the day of the premiere for our, for the film started singing someone to watch over me. And I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, oh wait, thinking, oh, my mom's saying that. And I go, why are you singing that song? And she goes, I don't know. I don't even know why I have that song in my head. And I go, I was like, my mom would perform that song on stage as one of the standards that she would sing. And that was part of her set for many, many years. And so it was just kind of like a little wink, you know, like, hi, I'm I'm right here with you. I see you. So, you know, that's just one little example of, of many things that have happened along the way. Okay. Okay. And do you pray? And if so, who or what do you pray to? I do pray. I believe that God is everywhere with me and his Holy Spirit is with me. I'm, I'm a Christian, so I was raised going to, to church. I, and I feel that, you know, for me, I don't try to get caught up in the legalism of it, but I right. believe that, you know, because it can be very political these days. And I try to stay out of that part of it because I really just believe that our mission in life is to love your neighbor as yourself, like that is what we are called to disagree with that, you know, and, and to really whoever that is and wherever that is to love your neighbor and to be, be light and to be love. And I feel like if God is love, that is what we are supposed to be. And we are, I believe we are made in that image. And so that is the, um, you know, the foundation from which everything I feel like should flow. And what do you feel that you have mastered in your life at this point and what still remains a work in progress for you? Oh, wow. That's a really interesting question. Um, mastered. I don't know if I've mastered anything quite yet. I really believe that life is a journey. And I think as when I was younger, maybe, maybe this would be it. I think when I was younger, I would think that I would be looking more for destinations and saying, I need to get to this point. And I think now I'm much more content in the journey of things. 
and understanding that there is an ebb and a flow and peaks and valleys and that they're all valid and they're all useful to mm. your own growth. You know, we are continually growing. We can continually learn. And I think when we stop, that's when we die, you know? And so I think that there are, you know, just lessons to be learned and to continue to grow. And it, even when you've been doing something for a long time, there's always something to learn. So yeah. that's, that's really the understanding of that, that it's a journey and that it's not really a destination. Okay. And what do you think you're still working on? Like what still remains a stumbling block for you? You know, I used to be somebody that was like super anxious and like struggled like with depression and anxiety and all of these things. And I, and I feel like I have mastered a lot of that and am much more okay with like the unknown. And so I think that now for me, it's more bringing that to the next level of that next level of faith of, I may not know what's going to happen, you know, two, mm-hmm. three months from now, like we're in the middle of a writer strike. I'm, I'm an actor for many years and we're, you know, yeah. like, so there's a lot of unknowns and that can really bring up a lot of stuff. If I don't really try to just like stay grounded and take it one day at a time. And so there are moments like that where I catch myself and have to like go back to the basics and just like, just like, okay, just focus on what is right in front of you. There will be enough light for the next step when you get there. Right. And your mom, what do you think that she became kind of a master of during her lifetime and what continued to be a work in progress for her from what you know? Yeah, no, I think she mastered in many ways her gift. You know, she understood that her gift her voice, her creativity, her artistry was a gift from God. She knew that very early on, that that was something that there was attached with a responsibility. And Mm -hmm. she took that very seriously. And I think that's why her voice just continued to get stronger and all of these things. Like she, so she mastered how to use her gift to reach people. So I think that's one of the, the things that makes her really a genius in her own way. Mm-hmm. And I think one of the things that she was still working on is, is how to really receive love, you know, without having to give, to just be able to like sit and receive. And I think, you know, during her illness in that period of time, that was something that she really had to just release because she was so used to being the one to output. So the one to just sit and understand that just you being you is enough. Okay. And so I think that was a big part of her, her journey that last year. What do you think you came into this life as Brooklyn Sedano to learn? And what do you think you came here to teach people? I think I came to learn to just probably what my mom learned, that just being who God created me to be is enough. That I don't have to do, like I'm a doer, I'm a Capricorn, like I feel I'm very driven, like I feel like, oh, I need to do something purposeful here. And sometimes I just have to understand that I'm okay just as I am, if even if I didn't do anything. So so there's that. And I I feel like my my job here is to be a voice for for truth and for love and for healing. And and I, I think this film is a part of that. I feel like that's why I'm also an artist is to use the gifts that I have to, to translate those things to people. Okay. Well, thank you, Brooklyn. I appreciate it. It Thank you, Allison. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you, Allison. Have a great day. All right. Thank you too. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. You can listen to this entire episode and other interviews of mine by going to Apple Podcasts or Spotify and downloading and subscribing to the Allison Interviews podcast.